Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to have a Q&A with uh, Michael Mead for the Future Thinkers members area. So Michael Mead is a renowned storyteller, author, and scholar of mythology, anthropology, and psychology. He's also the founder of Mosaic Multicultural Foundation, a non-for-profit network of artists, activists, and community builders that encourages greater understanding between diverse peoples. His podcast, Living Myth, looks at our changing world from a mythic perspective. To join Future Thinkers Q&As with thinkers and visionaries, become a member at futurethinkers.org slash members. Members get access to courses, workshops, and private group calls for deep dives into practicing sovereignty, resilience, and shadow work. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm going to introduce our wonderful guest today, Michael Mead. Michael is a renowned storyteller and author and scholar of mythology, anthropology, and psychology. He's also the founder of Mosaic Multicultural Foundation, which is a nonprofit network of artists, activists, and community builders that encourages greater understanding between diverse peoples. His podcast is Living Myth, which looks at our changing world from a mythic perspective. And I highly encourage you to check it out, um, give it a listen in this sense-making web that we find ourselves involved in. The storytelling and mythic perspective for me has been an essential um, ingredient. So really appreciate Michael for his wisdom and his perspectives. Michael, thank you for being here with us today. Good to be with you. Good to see you again, Tyson. Really good to see you. Oh, you guys have seen each other before? Once before, yeah, at the Stoa. The Stoa? Nice. The Stoa is so ahead of the curve all the time. That's <laughs> awesome. All right. So um, just kind of simple introductory question here. Um, you know, we, we talk about rites of passage. This is a month uh, with the theme uh, rites of passage inside of our community. Um, let's just kind of do a general introduction. What is the importance or the use of rites of passage in our society today? Well, in our society today, it's something more that's needed rather than something that's effectively in play or even understood. So one of the core ideas is that um, a person grows from a newborn to an adolescent naturally. The body's growing, the kind of psyche grows along with it in a sense. And, and there's a lot known about that in the modern world now, developmental theory. You can really learn about what's happening to the human psyche in the phases of growth, but it all changes at adolescence or youth, whatever we want to call it. And what happens there is the person has to leave the world of childhood in order to enter the world, not simply of adulthood, it's really the world of the rest of your life, the world of um, the calling that might be in your life, the world of uh, your fate and your destiny kind of thing. And whereas things were going based on natural development, developmental theory as well, the move from childhood to the next phase, a young adult and all, is not natural. It actually is a leap. It's like a second birth. It's an awakening of the psychological life as opposed to another phase in the phys physical life. So ancient cultures understood this. And so most traditional cultures had rites of passage for every girl, every boy. And there were three things I would say about it right away. One, it was the critical moment for cultural development. Cultures developed around the awakening of the individual in a sense, and the transformation from child to entering the path of one's life. That's where culture was born and reborn. Um, so when we don't have that, we have a diminished culture, which is, I would say, modern culture is a diminished culture. And without getting into the steps of rite of passage, two things that would happen that would be critical. And I'm not saying this happened in every tribe in every situation, but this, I think, is the essence of it. One thing is the awakening of the young person to who they are at their core and some stirring of what their vocation or calling in life might be. That would be one factor of the rite of passage. And the other would be the acknowledgement and identification of some kind of wound that they're carrying. That is to say, everyone who's born is wounded. 
And the realization of that would come more fully through a rite of passage. So you would have two things happening. One is uh, as, a, as the burgeoning adult or young person, I learn why I'm in the world. And the other thing is I get some intuition or straight on acknowledgement of some wound that I have. And that makes it clear that the dual purpose of rite of passage initially is to awaken oneself to oneself and to begin healing wounds that everyone carries from early life and childhood. So maybe I'll stop there. That's, that's the kind of, and the, and the service of rite of passage, it serves both the individual as a second birth, psychological, intellectual, emotional, further birth, and it serves the culture because it brings young people into the culture in an awakened state. And so um, in a way it becomes the second birth of the culture or another birth of the culture. And so I think we lose on all three levels. The culture doesn't have an awareness of giftedness and calling in young people. Young people enter the world either not knowing they have a wound or having no attention being given to it. And then the culture, modern culture, becomes an unaware culture that doesn't even understand the trauma of its citizens, let's say. So lacking rite of passage diminishes both the individual and diminishes the community and the culture. So that's Thank maybe you, yeah. beginning well, ideas, yeah. Um, I'm curious, uh, in one of our courses, we have a section on rites of passage and there is a uh, kind of a prompt to design your own rite of passage um, and, and to kind of customize it to your life uh, a little bit. And, you know, we, we live in times of Zoom, so there's not a whole lot of opportunity for that communal element to come in and, and like help with the graduation part of it. Um, I'm curious what old rites of passage still apply today and what you think would be some good new ones uh, to kind of fit with modern context. Well, I first want to react to the idea of designing your own rite of passage. So part of the sense of a rite of passage is that the initiate, another term for the seeker or the young person, surrenders to something bigger than them. And so, and this is where the cultural development occurs also, because what happens is there are initiators or elders or mentors, whatever we're going to call them, those who have already been through it and on a good day actually learn something, those who have been through it become the one who manage it and monitor it. And the one going through it has to let go. They have to let go of who they thought they were. They have to let go of their sense of responsibility in order to, in a sense, descend to a deeper place in terms of understanding their own life uh, and, and life, life in general. And so when, when a person designs this for themselves, they make two, two mistakes usually. One is they don't turn the heat up high enough. So change doesn't really occur. And the other is, is they turn it up too high and they burn themselves somehow. Someone else is supposed to be regulating the heat. If you think of it as a uh, alchemical process, someone else is supposed to be regulating the heat. And then, and, and this is a problem in the Zoom world to many, in many ways, then the individual going through it gets a connection to an older person who has been through it before them. And you begin the most genuine process of education, which is mentoring. All mammals mentor. Education, the deepest roots of it are learning directly from someone else. And of course, in that learning, both, both people, both sides learn. So again, the culture is losing because the young people aren't getting this connection to someone else that can be uh, the source of acknowledgement and support. And then the culture isn't getting people who are growing in terms of uh, having real knowledge about life and other people's lives. And so when you lose that process, you lose some of the capacity for young people to awaken and you lose elders. Elders can't be produced out of Zoom or out of uh, the internet. It's based on life experience. 
an experience of the lives of others. And so I'm sorry to say there's just a huge loss there. So the other part of what you're asking, I think, is, you know, what do we do now with rite of passage? So my understanding of these kind of things is that they're archetypal, that the process of it came from the deep human psyche. It, it resides there. Um, and the interest in it and longing for it comes from there. And then in a healthy situation for older people, as they learn more about life and themselves, they go, oh, I want to help the young people because I know what this is like. I know what the pains and the struggles and the sense of defeat can be like. And so um, when there isn't an active process, you lose all of that. Um, but in terms of new ways of doing it, my understanding of it is the new ways would come from understanding the archetypal roots, that the new things come out of the ancient things, that the immediate is connected to the ancient. So um, people always ask me, don't we need a new myth? And I, I used to say, well, send me your idea about a new myth. And then I just got totally discouraged because they read more like Hollywood scripts than they do myth and archetypal things are part of the depths of the human soul. They're part of our human inheritance. They become new when we live them. And so one more thing I want to add, I think we're in a collective rite of passage now. Um, the first step of rite of passage is separation. In, in a traditional sense, the young girl, the young boy would be separated from their family, from their community, from their schoolmates, and they would go through something that makes them realize that they are individual, that they are connected to everybody, but they are separate when it comes to their identity. Um, and what I think is going on now, if you imagine the deep soul is attentive to the world, we call it the modern world, but the deep soul is connected to it and observing it. And so now you have all, all kinds of us separated from each other, separated from communal events, separated from activities, separated in quarantine, separated from everybody. The soul thinks a rite of passage is underway. The soul thinks, oh, they started to separate and in order to awaken again. And so it's this ironic thing, like it's really painful to be separate. And then a part of the soul is going, yeah, we've been needing this because the whole culture needs to transform. And the root of any passage is transformation, literally moving from one form to another form. And we could call that form new, or we, call it, or we could call it renewed, because the new form is not completely separate from the old form, a branch on a tree is still connected to the tree, even if it's a new branch. So it may be new on one, in one sense, but it's renewed in another sense. Those are the thoughts that I have about it. I'd love to open it up to questions here if anyone wants to jump in. Her body chooses it. So girls' initiations evolved around the individual because um, the signal came from within the girl. So that's when the rite of passage is formed around that change in her body, her psyche, and so on. So uh, typically then the, the women would take the girl away from family and, and away from mother. And classic, a classic image, just to get a sense of it, is in parts of Africa, they have a specific tree. It's a hollow tree. And, and the girl is put into the inside of the tree. It's like going through a cave into the tree. And then she's treated like a fetus. She can't move in there anyway. So the women every day come and feed her. So she's like an infant being fed. She's like a fetus being fed by the mother. And she's also being fed all the stories of the feminine that the tribe might have. So she's being fed knowledge about being, happen to be born as a fem in feminine form. And so she's learning about what that means inside the tree which is considered to be a sacred container, the tree of life. And so she's being moved, they used to say, from the lap of the mother to the lap of mother nature. So a huge thing happens there that no longer happens typically, which is the individual person and the individual soul is directly connected to the soul of nature and the soul of the world. And so that one act means that that society is not in the condition we're in, which is culture divided from and often opposed to nature, the individual is a bridge 
between both. So that's a little idea of the girls. Now, the boys don't have an overt or even uh, an interior menses, unless you consider it to be an emotional menses, which is something you can kind of see. But since it's not individual, the boys would be brought into initiation when there's enough of them. So the boys go into a group. Um, and so the rites of passage for boys would, would typically be a group goes together. And in that part process, they bond with each other to some degree. Um, and inside the group though, the real initiation occurs when the boy awakens to who he is separate from the group. And by contrast, you could say the girl begins in this separation process and awakens to how she's part of the group through all of the older women. And so they're, they're contrasted that way. And, and starting from, I guess, from body changes into psychic changes. But the important thing down the line is that there were typically initiations that girl, young, that women and men went through together. So the original step seems to be learn who you are in your body and your psyche and your soul and your spirit. And then later on, learn how these things that seem so divided could go together through another type of initiation. So that's some initial thoughts about that. I'll say one more thing. Women know something about the feminine that men don't because they're living through the rhythm of it. And so women always have something to offer and teach to girls. Um, and men in a certain way knows a different sense of the rhythm of the masculine. And so that men have something often to offer and teach to the boys. Like right now in America, the United States, the violence is out of control. It's poured into the Capitol building. It's pouring through the universities. It's pouring through the high schools and through, and often through the men. And one of the things that would happen in a rite of passage on the masculine side is the older men would teach the, the boys that are just trying to enter that sphere why and how violence can erupt in them and what to do about it. Missing that piece you have a whole bunch of grown men. They look like grown men, but they act like you know, adolescent boys. And many of them are in positions of power. Straight up, that's what's happened. And so, so there's a critical thing there. Um, the other thing that would happen though, just to be, because it's complex, the boys would be taught about their inner womb and how to connect to feminine things. Like in the ancient Irish culture, the boys would learn to sing laments. And, but the words in the laments were about a girl or a woman going through struggle and pain. So the boys would be singing as if they were women going through it. I mean, these are really clever old things. If you listen to an old Irish lament, and the little, literally would be a guy singing, but the story is the woman's story. And then similar things happen with the girls. They would be introduced to aspects of the masculine. Everybody has masculine and feminine. And so you wouldn't have this accidental division that we have. It would be a more of an informed collaborative division. And, and, and the proof is in the tree. The tree is very masculine until you realize it's very feminine. The same tree that the girls were initiated inside, the boys might be initiated around on the outside. So the tree is one of those examples of a living symbol that has the feminine and the masculine. And I'm not saying all the tribes had it figured out because they didn't. There's all kinds of abuse and stuff like that. But mythologically, psychologically, in terms of symbolism, they had things that we don't have. Jennifer, did you have a question? Oh, you didn't. Okay. Uh, go ahead, David. I'm, I'm fascinated um, in the earlier you mentioned about the collective. Um, we're going through a collective rite of passage. Um, there's a couple of things that come to mind with that that are that are interesting. One is um, the first thing is wondering, you know, what is it that had to stop rites of passage? And and there's something like like that that's a, that's an interesting noticing that we've stopped that and stopped it even noticing like um, rites of passage for women with uh, with the arrival of menses is like it's now hidden, right? And there's a lot that's hidden in that. In some some way, it feels like what's coming forward. Um, 
is almost the building up of a larger something, uh, something that wants to break through. What, what, I, what I fascinated me about the way that we we're talking about this is that shift from um, being a, a child through adolescence into becoming an adult. And without that embodied knowing that moves through that, where I actually get to know that, it can be confused. That emotional self into the psychological self can merge and get confused. There's not a clear distinction and boundary there. And that, as it arrives in the culture, can result in cultures where we still act as adults in the way that children do. We acquire toys and we're looking for gratification rather than actually really giving back to. And something about it feels like the, the shift here, um, if, if I feel into my body, we may not be able to recover the individual rites of passage until we do go through the collective rite of passage, that we as a species need to re-enter uh, as a contributor back from taking, rather than taking from nature to grow, it's time for us to shift into seeing ourselves as partners with nature and, and growing. So I'm curious if you have senses about what that, what that how, how can we listen deeply to our intuition to know what that collective rite of passage looks like, or is it something that will, will emerge on its own? I think it's both of those. So I want to give one example of what you were talking about, where you, you have this merger that, that isn't really maturational growth. Mm, there's a universal pandemic that's deadly. Everybody's advised to wear a mask, not just to protect themselves, but to protect everybody else. That little bit of sacrifice would be something that would learn, be learned in a different culture. Oh yeah, of course, my actions affect other people, theirs affect me, and out of care for them, and, and a more developed understanding of ha having to sacrifice my immediate need for recognition, spontaneity, or, or pretend freedom, I'm wearing a mask. We're just, we see it just being lived out. And that's what I mean by also collective rite of passage. What's, go, what's happening with COVID-19, the pandemic, what's happening with climate change, what's happening with the struggle for truth, truth and justice, what's happening with um, the reckoning of racism. That's all part of a rites, a rites of passage. All these things that have been there all along now are breaking through. Um, so let me just say something about the steps because that helps me see what we might be going through. First step is separation. Um, the struggle in the United States between how do we go forward and include everybody versus go backwards and try to make America great again. I'm sorry, but that's a really bad slogan for me because it was never great for everybody. And it was not really even, even great for most, I would say. So separation, you can't go back. That's over. It's gone. We're bound to move forward. Um, in separation, there's always loss and there's blindness that occurs. But the next step is usually called the ordeal phase. And so that's when struggles are made and sacrifices are required. And I think that's exactly what we're in. We've already separated. The past is gone. There is no going back. There's only going forward. But that means to enter consciously the area of ordeals, of which all of them are happening at once. And then the final step is the return and the remaking of the community, the return and the, and the recognition on the individual's part and, and the collective group's part that we've all transformed. And that's where the big problem is because when we're in the ordeal stage, whether it's an individual, so like back in the day, our events would be in person live and I would ask a living audience how many people in this audience have uh, kind of had their life shatter or lost their life it seemed like and most hands would go up and some people would put up two hands and try to borrow a hand to make a statement about how many times it happened to them um, and that's what's happening to the culture now that everything we thought was the culture is either rattling it with uncertainty or in the midst of collapse and so that's the middle ground and the ordeal. And, and I think the problem with it in the biggest sense, when you're in the rite of passage, you can't see the outcome. It's not even your job. And so everybody trained to be, I think, overly logical and try to be reasonable and all, is trying to figure the game plan or the strategic plan for the next phase. And that won't work. 
because transformation means standing in the unknown long enough to let some known that you didn't know about find you. And so I think we're in the middle ground for quite a while. The resolution, I can't picture it completely, although I think you mentioned intuition. When people are in touch with their intuition, intuition, intimations of the future arrive. So there are people, artists, philosophers, healers, who are getting glimpses of the next world. But some parts of it we do know because uh, one of the mantras now is we're all in this together whatever this next version of the world is, it should include everybody, you know, as a root understanding. And once you do that, you're moving towards being connected to nature because nature includes everything you could ever imagine, everything from a thunderstorm to the delicacy of a flower breaking through the ground. Nature is diverse. That's the source of understanding diversity in human nature. And so once we get closer to human nature, we feel more connected to great nature. I think that's what's trying to happen. How it happens is a little bit of a mystery. Since I said that, I should say one other thing that's behind all of this kind of imagination, and that is learn from nature. That is to say, the mystery of life, death, renewal. That's what nature goes through all the time. And human nature does too. We just forgot about it. Go ahead, Edward. I'd like to go back a little bit. You were talking about the differentiation of rites of passage between boys and girls. Now, this is in some ways current. This was a personal to me in that I have a, a son who's trans now, 19 years old, born a girl. So I had to get used to that. I think he chose just the kind of thing to, to get to me because I work with my body. So biology, bodies, they're all perfect. Not this one, apparently. Anyway, so can you talk to, uh, within the trans community and the non-binary community, there's a lot of talk of in different cultures, there weren't simply two genders and there was an agreement of multiple different kinds of genders and mixes. Can you just speak to that a little bit and also with respect to rites of passage, if there's anything yeah. other than you can offer? It is, thank you, good question. So what, one of the things that's happening in the collective rite of passage the way I see it is the dissolution of the binary idea of male and female, feminist, feminine, uh, feminine and masculine. So it's as if the body of humanity is needing to change itself or awaken everybody to the idea that these distinctions are always limited. So then you get a gender, um, on, on an arc or a range that goes all the way from strongly feminine to strongly masculine and everything in between. That's part of the rite of passage. Is when every, we're all in this together means we're all in this together with our variations. So that's one level. But when to tie it further into rite of passage, in many uh, traditional groups, um, those who we call transgender, transgender which in American, Native American uh, practice would be called the two-spirit people, right? Uh, they have both spirits in equal or somewhat you know, proportional feminine and masculine. They're the two-spirit people. They would be the initiators <laughs> because they would be like a pronounced form of the fact that the human psyche is always masculine and feminine. And so therefore they would be considered to be spiritual people tied to the spiritual world in an unusual way, but also able to understand, sympathize with and empathize with the masculine and the feminine in whoever's going through the initiation, who is primarily boy, primarily girl, but not simply that. So I think what's happened is this kind of inner sense of psychological understanding of the complexity of gender and the fluidity of it is now embodied because there's evidence that there are more transgender children, as we call them, it's as if the human body is expressing itself more fully and saying, you have to understand this uh, because it's your children, it's your neighbors, it's your teachers, it's your students. So I think that's part of the rite of passage. In other words, part of the, imagine the, the trouble of peop, people that won't accept it, don't like it 
they want the binary form because it's kind of seems secure, even though it's psychologically not accurate. So what's happening is people thought they knew what it was about. And then there are children that come along and say, it's not about that. I'm not about that. And we're their parents. And so then everybody has to understand we are now getting knowledge we didn't have. And that's very scary to people. And some, some people shut down. Uh, parents do that. And some parents, thank you, uh, see the beauty of what's happening to their own children and realize, no, it's me that has to transform in order to continue to parent them. And because I love them, I'm going to do that. And then that knowledge moves into the world. That's part of the rite of passage. Michael, can you comment on the, the sort of cultural um, desire to commit to those binary labels? And even in the situation where someone may feel too spirited or some not feeling right in their body and then cascade all the way over to a, a, another label with all the roles and expectations that are part of that. I'm curious, like, yeah, I'd love to hear you comment on if there's a gradient and where, if we overcorrect sometimes when it comes to gender. We almost always correct, overcorrect when it comes to gender. I think that it's the nature of people, humans, to over adapt to the initial circumstances they're in. And I'll go back to my, I take like psychology and stuff and turn it into stories. That's how I think. So if we go back to the infant that's going, uh, okay, mom's not looking at me anymore. I need some more of that. And mom is doing it not because she's mean or, or, or whatever, afraid of her own child or anything, but because she has other responsibilities. The infant is now going to adapt. How do I get mom to notice me now? I'll scream as loud as I can. If that doesn't work, you know, they'll move on to something else. So I think the same thing happens with children entering the structural stuff of their environment, their family, their community, their society, um, and trying to fit in in order to get recognized, in order to have a place. I mean, that's what so much of uh, school is about, is trying to fit in to the structure as it is. So I think we have, by definition, over-adapted to the binary construction. I think that's really what happens. If you go back to what I was saying about one of the first functions of initiation rite of passage is to reveal oneself to oneself. If that's really happening, then what's happened is both feminine and masculine things are being revealed. Uh, I grew up in a tough neighborhood in New York. And I know for a fact that things that are more natural to me, that, you know, storytelling, being emotional, singing, you know, be, operating out of feeling and all kinds of things, I'd have shut that down really fast, or I was going to be excluded from being with the boys. And so I know that I became over adapted to a macho style. I even had to do it to survive. So I know that that happens. And why I'm somewhat enamored of rites of passage and initiation is because the function is to reveal who is in there, the essential identity. And that would automatically mean that you would get your entire var var uh, variance along the gender scope. And so um, let me say this also. Rites of passage initiations would happen outside the village if we're in a traditional situation. It's outside the village. It's in nature. That says that this kind of understanding is not part of the village operation. The village is like the, the culture that needs to keep going. It, it has an economy. It has all these principles that are part of being human, but it doesn't have the capacity to deal with its own people the way a, a, a family doesn't have the capacity to really to deal with the spontaneity of the child. And so the rites of passage would happen in nature Everyone would be moved from the lap of the mother to the lap of mother nature. People would feel mm, a thread, a living thread that goes right into the world of nature. And if you look at nature, you have every kind of uh, expression of biology, all kinds of them. Hermit crabs 
are both feminine and masculine and you can go on and on. So it's part of nature and it's part of human nature. And there is always an over adaptation to the family, first of all, to the community and to the society. And so that's almost like taken for granted. And all the ideas around initiation and rite of passage are radical separations from the daily process of culture, which is necessary for creating food, for, for all kinds of things. Now, when it's a collective rite of passage, one way that I see it is that the standard culture, we're just watching in, a, in the United States here, everything struggled through this political trap that, that keeps being reconstituted, no matter what the good intentions or bad intentions are. Um, and so what has to happen is stuff has to come in from the outside that changes that. And so the initiates were also called the outsiders. That is to say, there's knowledge, there's dreams, there's imaginations trying to enter the culture. Uh, they have to enter through human psyches, um, but they can't enter directly in because people have identified by political party, by ideology. You can't get ideas in there. They're gonna keep struggling with what they already have. The ideas come from the outsiders and one of the names for initiates was the outsiders. So those, like the, uh, the father's um, transgender child, could be see as an, seen as an outsider, partly here to bring in knowledge that otherwise isn't here, that turns out to be beneficial for everybody. And that's the core nature of the rite of passage, is it renews the society in a beneficial way. Again, I'm not saying that tribes did it all right and all. I'm saying that that's the archetypal dynamic. So we, our expectation that the politicians are gonna solve this is probably ill-founded. It's gonna be solved. I mean, when you are talking at the beginning about how you imagine the community of everybody involved, uh, you mentioned that at the beginning. That's, that's part of it. How, how do we have forms that are more open without being empty? more open to the radical nature of the individual because the awakened individual is the person who changes culture by staying connected to culture while being an outsider on many levels. So that's the background idea is in the middle of the rite of passage, the young people get inspired in ways that are different from what's happening in the culture. And then the initiators and mentors would awaken not to what they knew, but to what's coming through the children, young people coming through, and then they would help deliver it. Like right now, young people need mentors and teachers and all who can help them figure out who they are and then figure out how could that being and essence work for them in the culture. And here's one positive thing. When everything's breaking down, the calling, the vocation that every young person has can get through more readily. That's a positive possibility. All right, that was it for our Q&A with Michael Mead and Future Thinkers members. To become a member, go to futurethinkers.org slash members. Our members get access to courses, workshops, and private group calls for a deep dive into practicing sovereignty, resilience, and shadow work. We'll see you next time. If you like this content, you might want to check out our seven ways to adapt to the future guidebook. Get it for free at futurethinkers.org slash sign up. You might also want to check out our Future Thinkers membership area. We have courses there to help you adapt to the changing world, build resilience, upgrade culture and society, and create meaning and purpose in your life. As well, you'll get access to our community, all of our unreleased content, private Zoom calls, live Q&As with guests, workshops and events, and more. Just go to members.futurethinkers.org. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and comment. It really helps out our show more than you know. And if you want more like it, then subscribe and hit that bell icon to be notified of new videos. See you next time.